Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Monique Mondesi, physician owner of Optimal Care Pediatrics located in St. Lucie West. Thank you for joining us. Today we're going to be discussing learning disorders and I'm going to let my guest introduce himself. Thanks. I'm Dr. Jim Forgan, licensed school psychologist with a specialty in school neuropsychology for learning disabilities like dyslexia, dysgraphia, some other things that are common in working with young kids who struggle with learning. And my practice is based in Jupiter and in Stewart. Excellent. So first question, what types of learning disabilities do you see? Well, the most common learning disability is dyslexia. So that is a reading disorder. And one in five children in school struggle with some form of dyslexia from very mild um, to severe. So it's a common learning disorder. The other common learning disorder is dysgraphia. That's difficulty with writing. And then dyscalculia, which is a learning disability in math. Okay. So learning disabilities can occur in reading, writing, and math. And other co-occurring disorders that go along with learning issues are things like anxiety. So anxiety is very prevalent in kids who struggle with learning because their struggles in learning really create the anxiety that they have as well. Okay. And how are they diagnosed? So learning disabilities are diagnosed through a battery of tests. And for dyslexia, there's no one test that's universally accepted for dyslexia. So you have to use a battery of 10 different tests. Wow. So dyslexia is more of an auditory processing disorder than a visual processing disorder. You know how many times people think people with dyslexia reverse B's and D's, which they often do. But dyslexia is a difficulty with the phonological system of language, so the sound system of language. So you need to do some different tests that deal with the phonological processing, and that means with the sound system of language. So dyslexia is a breakdown in the sound system of language. That's why kids are confused when they see certain letters and they don't know the sounds that go with them. Or they go to spell a word and they're not sure which letter represents the sound. So they think of a word like you know, church and they're not sure what letters may go with it. So dyslexia affects not only reading, but also spelling as well. So there's a battery of tests. It's called a psychoeducational evaluation or a neuropsychological evaluation. So if you think your child's struggling, you would want to have uh, the school system do the psychoeducational evaluation or go into a private practice and look for a psychologist who specializes in um, school neuropsychology or other types of psychoeducational evaluations with a specific emphasis on the areas that you're most concerned about so if it was dyslexia, you would want to find somebody who you know, has a specialty in dyslexia. Okay. And then what age do you pick that up at? So for an astute parent, you can pick up dyslexia at about age five and a half. So there are warning signs before kids get to age five and a half. But generally, when somebody is halfway through kindergarten and has had the opportunity for the formal reading instruction mm -hmm. that they receive in kindergarten, then you can... Um, diagnose this. So what would be the warning signs? So the number one warning sign for dyslexia is family history. Mm. So if you have diagnosed dyslexia or even suspect undiagnosed dyslexia in the family tree, then your child you know, may be at risk for that also because learning disabilities are genetic in at least half of the cases. So Family history is number one. Secondly, you would want to have concerns if your child does not like you know, playing any type of a word game. Like for young kids, we read them a lot of nursery rhymes. So you should be able to read you know, a nursery rhyme with your child. And after reading it a couple of times, pause when there's supposed to be a rhyming word. Like Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great. And then your child should be able to fill that in because they would start to understand the rhyming with uh, our language. So if they have no interest in doing rhyming games, if they have uh, in preschool no interest in learning their letters or the sounds that go with their letters, 
then you would have concerns there also. And of course, once they get into formal school, if your child struggles with learning to read and then subsequently says, you know, I'm stupid, I'm not good at this, then you would have, you know, some pretty big concerns there also. Sure. So most, most young kids who struggle with learning, especially in kindergarten and first grade, want to learn, right? Young kids in kindergarten and first grade want to do well in school. And so when there's these unexpected um, struggles or challenges, then you would want to get that checked out. Okay, excellent. So what is an IQ test? So an IQ test is a novel way at looking at problem solving with a child. So there's a common IQ test called the Weschler Intelligence Scale for Children. That's the most commonly used IQ test. And so sometimes people think that IQ tests have reading, math, and writing on them, but they don't. Okay. So when you give a child an IQ test, you're giving 10 subtests that look at the child's approach to solving problems. So one of the subtests is doing things with cubes. So you're looking at a child's visual and spatial processing by giving them cubes and asking them to build different designs. On other subtests, you're assessing logic. So kids are looking at pictures and thinking about relationships within pictures. For other subtests, there's critical thinking that's verbal. So you're asking kids to compare words. And then there's some tests of memory and then processing speed. So an IQ test is way more than a score. Some people get fixated on the score of their child's IQ, mm -hmm. but in uh, psychology, we're really looking at the underlying processes that go into a child's approach to solving you know, problems. And then from that, we can look for different patterns of strengths and weaknesses that help okay. with following up with other types of assessments that kids might need to help pinpoint where, where they struggle. So would you use an IQ test to help diagnose a learning disorder? You do. Okay. So when you do the learning disability testing, it's that psychoeducational evaluation. And at the most basic level, you have an IQ test. Okay. You have reading, math, and writing. And then you have some tests of processing. So that's at the basic level what uh, a psychologist needs to do. It's also good, though, if you have somebody who can give some social emotional tests to look at self-esteem oh, since so many of these kids struggle you know, with anxiety and self-image mm -hmm. because when you struggle ongoing you, you kind of feel dumb for sure and so it's always good to tap into that to see if kids need some more social and, and emotional support as well as academic support okay excellent thank yes. you for for explaining that sure and well, how are learning disabilities addressed at home, or how can they be addressed at home? So usually it should be um, a, at least a two-prong approach of school and home, mm -hmm. right? So there's things the school can do, there's things parents can do. One of the things I recommend for parents is to, at home, try to make learning fun. Because if kids are in school and they struggle, they're working very hard. And then of course there's homework, which nobody really enjoys. So kids don't often find homework very fun either. So at home, if parents can make the learning fun by using apps or websites, you know, like ABC Mouse is an, a common app. Um, there's a website called Nessie, N-E-S-S-Y dot com. Or by writing your own stories about your child and then asking your child to read back those stories to you. For instance, you might make a, an all about me book. And so if your child is younger, they might um, take pictures, put those on computer paper, and then write some sentences about the picture. Okay. So that the child then has things to read about him or herself. So most young kids need parent support with that. So you might have a picture of the child's favorite toys, and then the child tells the parent, my favorite toys are X, Y, and Z. So the parent writes it down. Then you go to the next page. You know, my favorite color is blue, and the parent writes that down. On the next page, my favorite food is pizza, and they write that down. So there's a picture, then there's the sentences. Okay. So that makes reading fun for kids. 
because they start to enjoy reading about themselves because most people enjoy learning and talking about themselves. Okay. So then it becomes a fun way for kids to read for a, a, a real purpose. Okay. Then they can read their story to their grandparent, to their dog, you know, to their siblings. Okay. So yeah. then it becomes an enjoyable task versus just trudging through you know, pages of homework. Of right. Reading. Um, that's what I get that question a lot about, like homework taking hours and hours. Um, any other tips on how to cut down like the amount of time that it takes to get through the homework? You're right. I, I get parents coming to me saying, if my child would just buckle down and do their homework, right. it would be done in 10 minutes. But they right. complain and they drag it out for 30 or, or an hour. Right. So it is hard work. And so when I work with kids, I often ask them, you know, is homework hard for you? And how do you help yourself get your homework done? So many kids will tell me a reward, you know, at the end. Okay. If they can draw a picture, go on their computer or, or tablet for some screen time. Okay. Some kids, you know, buy into that, that work hard and you get a reward. Other kids, I think, need to activate their mindset. So... For some kids, I think it would be good if parents can you know, do something um, fun before the homework in terms of activating a child's mindset, like saying, today is you know, Marvelous Monday. Let's walk around the house making marvelous noises before we do our homework. And everybody walks around and they blow their trumpet and they make noises and funny dog sounds or cat noises, and it gets kids blood flowing, it gets them uh, up and moving, and it releases some positive endorphins. And then, then it's, okay, now let's transition into doing our homework after this. So, you know, there's little things like that that I think parents can be creative in helping kids become um, problem solvers. That's interesting. I never thought of like being more active before the homework. I always tried to say, okay, this is my six year old. Right. Let's sit down and get the homework done quickly, you mm. know, <laughs> right after school. But that's good. I like that. I'll try, I'll try that one. I'll let you know. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> um, what about behavior interventions for learning disorder? Can you talk about those behavior interventions as well as uh, medication intervention? So when a parent has their child evaluated, especially by a psychologist in private practice, the psychologist in private practice will look at learning issues, but also behavioral things like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, because in kids with learning disabilities, about 40% of kids with learning disabilities have you know, ADHD as well. So you wanna get the big picture through that testing process to see if it's just a learning issue, if it's a behavior issue or a combination type of issue. Because some kids who have both do need the medication. Mm -hmm. And that's when, you know, as a psychologist, I defer to pediatricians and other medical professionals mm -hmm. to have the talk about prescribing the medication. Um, at home, the main thing that uh, parents, I find, are doing are using some type of charting system, you know, when kids are having behavior problems. And the charting systems are not generally used for months on end. You know, it's usually a short-term solution to okay. a problem. So if a parent is having a child who is having a hard time, you know, staying on task, then they use a charting system to help their child um, receive rewards for staying on task and completing their homework. Okay. So, so behavioral interventions are often charting. When it's real extreme, parents uh, may work with a behavior specialist, like a behavior therapist. Okay. Can you also talk about educational interventions? Yes, so that in that two-prong approach that I referred to, it's good to get the school on board. So if the school recognizes that there is a learning disability, then they will write up what's called the Individualized Education Plan, or IEP for short. And when you have an IEP, that means your child is in special education. 
So then the special education teacher will work with your child to provide educational interventions at school. Okay. And usually they'll give parents homework of things that they can work on at home with their child. But if they don't, then many parents go with private tutors. Because in my opinion, the one-on-one -on -one instruction is best for helping kids make the most progress in the shortest amount of time. Because even though in school you have the IEP, which says individualized education plan, it's not one-on-one -on -one instruction. The best is small group of one teacher to three kids, okay. or even more. So private tutoring is usually uh, an effective way to help kids close the gap between where they are and where their peers are in where terms of learning. a parent get a private tutor from? So you can get a private tutor from uh, professional organizations like the International Dyslexia Association okay. has a list of uh, practitioners. Um, other uh, tutors can be found on websites like care.com or if you work with a psychologist for testing and they recommend tutoring, they should have a list of tutors also. Okay. Because Excellent. when a child's diagnosed with a learning disability, you just don't want homework help type of tutoring. That will maintain the child, but it's not going to help close the gap for where they need to get to in, in terms of learning. So parents of kids with learning disabilities need to work with tutors who specialize in learning disabilities. Okay, excellent. Thanks for clearing that up. Sure. This is another question I get a lot. What's the difference between the 504 and the IEP? Okay, so the IEP means special education, and that provides the school district with extra money to teach your child. So the IEP gives more resources to parents and then more rights in terms of um, what happens if there are disagreements or if parents don't think their childs are making enough progress. So an IEP is more complex to get in the public school system. Where the 504 plan, it comes from the Americans with Disabilities Act and that came out of section 504. So that's why it's called the 504 plan. And so that plan just makes reasonable accommodations for children. So for like those children with ADHD who need to stand up and stretch, that's an accommodation. It doesn't change what the child is learning, but it just gives them the opportunity for movement. So the 504 plan is free, right? Schools don't get any extra money for that, but they make what are called reasonable accommodations that are things that often translate to really good teaching practices okay. as well. So do the same conditions um, qualify for 504 and IEP? So oftentimes they can. So in terms of ADHD, if you have, if your child has ADHD, then they may be eligible for the 504 plan. The, the main thing that the school is looking for is to document a need for services. Because some kids have ADHD and they just sail through and they do fine because they have maybe outside treatment like medication and so that just helps them perform well in school. But other kids have a need for the plan because they need preferential seating in front of the classroom. Right? They need extra time on test. They need the stretch breaks. They need to sit on um, a bouncy ball for a chair instead of a, a normal chair. So as long as the school recognizes that there's a need, then they write up the 504 plan okay. for services. It's when the child's struggling with um, learning also and needs some real extensive services that they often write the IEP. So there are kids with ADHD who have a 504 and others have an IEP. You don't want both, okay. right? You just get one or the other. And it depends upon the severity and the needs that the childs have. So can you only get a 504 IEP in the public school system? 
Correct. Okay, so the private school system, there is no 504 or IEP. So usually the public schools have the 504 and IEP. Private schools do accommodation plans. So sometimes they don't call it the 504 plan, but they do make accommodations for kids in private schools. Also, they just give their plans a different name. Okay. So what is the process for, like I think my child has ADHD or dyslexia, how do I start that process of getting the IEP? Okay, so if you have a concern about your child in the public school, then you want to submit a request in writing to the, the principal or the special education contact or coordinator saying that you are concerned about your child and here's why, and you would like to request a formal evaluation of your child. So that would start the process. And then it is a lengthy process. So I hear from parents who oftentimes have kids in public school that the school drags their feet right? because they have a large volume of kids that they're servicing and they have to document that your child really does have a need that goes beyond just what the classroom teacher can do to help the child. So the public school then would start the process for evaluation and, and meeting with parents and teachers to determine if they need to move forward with, with testing. Okay, so can it take a whole school year? Sometimes it does. Sometimes it takes nine, 12 months to get you know a plan in place because schools have to document so many different um, strategies and interventions that they've used along the way to make sure that it's not just a lack of teaching or instruction, but is really a disability that is causing the child to struggle. Do you have um, a template letter or a website that you like um, for that initial letter to request the IEP? So, yes. I have, a, I have a book coming out in April, oh, great. and it's called the ADHD Empowerment Plan. And it has um, sample letters for both the 504 plan and the IEP. Okay. So even though it's about um, empowering and finding strengths in kids with ADHD, it also can be used to help kids with learning disabilities also. Oh, excellent. So that's published by um, Proofrock Press, and it's available for pre-order on Amazon and will be officially released in April. Oh, excellent. So we'll that's one source, that. right. Okay, perfect. And then there's another a website called Wright's Law. So it's Pete Wright, it's W-R-I-G-H-T. So wrightslaw.com. They have some sample um, materials there for parents also. Perfect. Yes. And what type of accommodations would you see in the classroom for a child with um, dyscalculia mm -hmm. or dysgraphia or ADHD? So the most common types of accommodations are preferential seating, you know, move them close to the board or close to the teacher, then extended time on test, okay. the small group testing, um, the frequent breaks. So those are all very common accommodations. There are less common accommodations also that are available. Like if you have a learning disability and you're struggling with reading, teachers can read the math, you know, sections to you, science, social studies, health. So you can have a reader. You could also have a scribe. So if you have dysgraphia and your penmanship is illegible and it's maybe painful for you to write, then you could have a scribe who writes down everything for you. Okay. And so the student just has to dictate, you know, what they want to say to their scribe and the scribe would write it down. Or some kids use the, the speech to text, right? Mm -hmm. That we are using on our iPhones and other devices yeah. that are, are that's accommodation also in school. Excellent. Yes. And what resources exist for kids with a learning disability in middle school and high school? Because we find that um, most of the time they're getting diagnosed in elementary school and they get a lot of support there. Mm -hmm. But what happens as they move forward? So if they have the IEP or 504 plan, it does move forward with them. So both documents are reviewed uh, on an annual, once a year basis. And at that time they can be revised and updated in case accommodations or services change. 
by the time kids get into middle school and high school, the you know accommodations are about the same, except some kids in high school get preferential scheduling. You know how it is with um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, where some kids are slow to wake up in the morning. They're very groggy and they have a hard time getting out of bed. And their mind's sluggish in the morning. So high schools often give preferential scheduling so that that student in high school has an elective first period. That way, if they're late or they're slow in waking up, by the time they get the second or third period for math and language arts, they have more mental energy. So preferential course scheduling. Other kids get preferential locker placement in middle school or high school because that changing of classes in a short amount of time mm -hmm. creates a lot of anxiety and stress for kids. And some kids with learning disabilities are not real good at sequencing. So the combination on a combination locker mm -hmm. can be real frustrating for kids. So they may get preferential placement in a central part of the school so that they have time you know, to get okay. everything figured out, their locker materials swapped out and whatever they need so they don't have to just put everything in a backpack and carry it with them wearing you know like a 20 pound sack yeah. on their back yeah which can be not good for your posture exactly not good all right so then i get this question a lot as well um what happens if a child is denied a 504 or iep um but the parent still feels like that you know this child mm. needs help and they need some services what can a parent do so when a child is denied services, a parent should look for a parent advocate to come you know, review the documents that the school produced mm -hmm. and then maybe attend the next meeting with them. Um, parent advocates can be found um, through the school system. There's uh, parents as liaisons or PALS. And the PALS folks are volunteers who have you know, an education background who oftentimes come with parents to the meetings because in in these meetings it can be intimidating sure. because there's mm -hmm. many school professionals there's mm -hmm. therapists and other folks and then there's just little old you or you and your husband and so to have an advocate who understands the jargon mm -hmm. can be really helpful otherwise you can google you know parent um, advocates for IEP meetings Okay. Or you can contact somebody like me because I have a list of you know, people who advocate for parents also. But of course, it is private pay, so it does cost a little bit of money. Sure. But sometimes it is worth the investment. Sure, to get those services. Right. Excellent. And what other types of specialists might be involved um, in caring for a child with a learning disability? So when it's a learning and behavioral disability, there's oftentimes a team approach. So there's the family, the child, maybe the extended family, if they're providing you know, some respite care or, or watching the child while parents work. And then you have a pediatrician like you, if there's going to be medication involved. There might be a tutor involved if there's some learning issues. And then sometimes other therapists like occupational therapists might be helping kids with dysgraphia with their handwriting and fine motor control. Um, occupational therapists also help kids who have sensory issues. So if kids have issues with you know, tags on their clothing or certain clothing textures irritate their skin, then many occupational therapists work with the sensory part also. Some kids work with physical therapists, counselors, if there's anxiety. So it's usually a, a, a team approach. And then of course the school personnel, like the special ed teacher, general education teacher. So many of these people come and go, right? So if your child does counseling short term and everything is well, and your counselor gets you know moved out and um, the team gets a little bit smaller, but they're still there in case the child needs that later on, depending upon the, the situation and circumstances. So. It's usually good to get the support and not try to do this alone because sure. it can be exhausting. It takes a village, right? It does. <laughs> and what laws protect uh, children with learning disabilities? So the main law for kids with learning disabilities is the Individuals with Disabilities Act, IDEA. 
And so the IDEA law provides the what are called procedures from the federal government that come down to the states that get transferred to the school districts of how kids get diagnosed with disabilities. So when you go to get an IEP, you are working within the framework of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act procedures. So it's very complicated in my opinion, okay. and oftentimes confusing to parents. So that's why it is good to try to bring an advocate with you or um, a family member or psychologist or other person who understands the terminology. That way it helps you understand you know, your rights and how to get the best plan for your child. The other law is that Americans with Disabilities Act, which gives you the 504 plan. Okay, excellent. Any closing thoughts for us or final tips? So I think in closing, you know, as a parent, what I would advise you to do is to don't take a wait and see approach mm -hmm. because waiting and seeing if things will get better oftentimes causes you to miss out on valuable time for helping your child. So I believe there's a critical window you know, between kindergarten and about fifth grade that if there's a learning disability, you have to get the right help and in specialized instruction during that time. Because by the time kids get to middle school and high school, the volume of work becomes so you know, insane that kids who struggle tend to feel overwhelmed and oftentimes you know, will shut down or develop these coexisting disorders like anxiety and depression and behavior issues. So don't take the wait and see approach get um, evaluations to pinpoint what's going on so then you can hone in on the right treatments right. for your child. And the amount of money and time you invest now will really pay dividends in the end. So it's a lot of sacrifice for parents mm -hmm. to do the testing, drive the tutoring, or you know, bring other professionals in. But in the end, it's worth it to start early. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I really look forward to your new book. Uh, we'll put the link on our, our page. Okay. okay. Wonderful. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you all for joining us. Have a good afternoon.